Welcome to Game Over Montreal. We are where we always are. The Montreal Canadiens have lost again. They got pounded in the first period and then tried to make a game out of it, but couldn't get a save when they most needed a save, which is the story of this week and much of the season. But hey, let's uh, let's talk about some fun stuff. I'm going to bring in our guest tonight, which is Shane Malloy. How you doing, Shane? I'm doing great. And watching the Habs game, it was a lot of rinse and repeat of yes. the last, you know, couple weeks through last three weeks of critical errors that, you know, in a breakdown and then it ends up in the back of their net. And yes, of course, you're always going to make, there's always going to be mistakes made, but I think, you know, in some cases because of who's on your team or who's missing, not that you always want to play a little bit more safe, but in some respects, you, you kind of have to like pick your spots, maybe a little bit more conservatively. And then as you said, it like, yes, these are both these goaltenders are still, you know, young in terms of their, you know, their development, but they still got to make a qual. They got to make a save. Yeah. Like obviously Montalbán, like there was two of them. He should have had back. I think Primo could have had one back. And although he played really well coming off the bench and being cold, it just, that's the difference between just getting all of a sudden buried. And you can see the guys on the bench, like trying to like rah, rah back. But every time a, like if a bad goal gets him, you can get, it's okay. I mean, you were a goalie. I was a defenseman. I get in the way, you know, or I'd make a stupid play and the goal would go in be my fault. Right. But like you get one or two of those a game and it just deflates the bench. Right? Yeah. And you know, like we, you hear a lot of talk in like, uh, analytical circles about how like uh, timely saves is not a, a thing. Sometimes it's a thing. <laughs> like, no, it, if, like, it's a thing here. Yes. Right? Yes. That's the thing. It may not be like over the course of a season, it's not going to be a thing. Right. But in a single game where you are mentally affected by things that are happening, like if Primo stops that shot that makes it five to three, this game likely ends up at least in overtime. Like the Canadians were absolutely buzzing. And, you know, the fact is like the Blue Jackets are not a great team overall. So the, it's a team the Canadians could theoretically, you know, make it back into the game against. Does it matter in the grand scheme of things? Of course not. But just in terms of how this season is gone, they kind of need mentally to get into some games once in a while well, they need, they need be some competitive they need some, some they need some not i'm not talking about wins they gotta win the game but they gotta they need some small wins throughout yes. the game to build build some of that now i'll go against the analytic community when they say oh timely save doesn't matter just because you don't know how to measure it and quantify it doesn't mean it doesn't exist and it doesn't mean that it doesn't it, like it has value. Like they, I hear crazy things like in the NHL where they say, "Well, you can't put a number on heart." Well, scientists have been doing that for decades. Of course you can, and that's like your emotional component of of your brain, along with obviously the mental side. So, like when people say that, it's nonsense. Like scientists, have, it's been proven out. You can numerically put a value on that. And then how you do it is like how you wait and measure that is up to you. So I always like fire back at notions that just because you don't know how to do it doesn't mean other people don't know how to do it or it doesn't exist or it doesn't have an impact, right? Because it's, it's just more harder to quantify in some respects if you don't know how. So it's the difference between le leading measurements and lagging measurements. And most of analytics of what we talk about in the public sphere, even in amongst NHL teams, it's based on lagging, it's outport output indicators yes you know so it's like okay what about the leading right like we need to discuss this this matters right and the problem is it's harder to you know it's a little bit more difficult in terms of you know difficult to measure it but easy to influence so if you can figure out how to measure those leading measure measurements more effectively boy that's where competitive advantage comes in and that's where i'm interested to see what happens obviously 
as this our the evolution of our industry continues. Um, but in Montreal's case, it it matters. Like you need to have that that momentum swings mentally and emotionally. It's real. Yeah, it's real. It like it exists, right? Like I played enough sports in a variety of different sports where you can see it coming. And what starts it is how people react to those situations emotionally and, ment- and mentally. And then the, the difficulty is, and what a lot of people don't recognize is that body language and how you react is contagious. It's like the flu and how I react and how I like what I do. If we're on a team will affect you to what degree it affects you. That's uncertain that that solely depends on you, but it matters. And it's like, it can be quantified. So I think, you know, from I, this is like, the same thing we talked about last time and last game, it, it, the, the game is very similar in terms of just like, you know, something good happens and they get on a roll and then a couple bad things happen. It's almost like one step forward and two steps back. Um, and it's been, it's been unfortunate, but we also, we, we had to look at what the team is. Like it's ridiculous. So, like, what are they? Are they going to potentially break the record for number of game man games lost? That's insane. We're halfway through the season. I know it's uh, and, the and people, compounding people me. the compounding uh, issues that this team is dealing with. It's like the record is something we've never seen before, but so is the confluence of issues. It is unbelievable. It's um. <laughs> It's just when it rains, it pours. And at this point, it's almost as a fan, you almost have to start laughing at the situation that what what could potentially else go wrong? Like there are injuries, the COVID, like it's just, and and timely is timely injuries of key personnel. And don't tell me that next man up. Like, I know it's nice to say that. But that's that great. only but works that's, so far, right? Like that that's that has severe limitations, right? Like when you start pushing guys into roles that they're not ready for or they're not capable of, of producing in those roles, especially when you have a lot of them, it's just like it's a compounding effect of when they make a mistake, you know, everybody tries to make up for it instead of instead of not trying to do that. So it's I feel bad for the fans from that respect, but also it's, there's also like a positive spin on that. As you look at this, I look at this roster when they're healthy. I mean, aside, obviously Shea Weber not being there, there's a competitive roster. They should be fighting for a playoff spot. I, they probably wouldn't make it based on the East. The East is a juggernaut this year, but they should be in the fight, particularly, especially if Carey Price was like healthy because he can steal games on his own. So and that's like obviously with this press conference, um, you know, you cross your fingers for the guy and you hope he comes back and hope that, you know, he has a happy life and things go well for him. But it's such an uncertainty for this organization of just not knowing. Like there's yeah. no indication of whether it's going to be his injury is going to be two months, six months career. They just don't know. Yeah, I, I can't imagine there are many fans who watched that or listened to that uh, Carey Price press conference and came away like particularly heartened by it, if you know what I mean. Like, yes, it's good that he's showing his face around the team again and he's been out skating with the team. So, like, the rehab is beginning, but the lack of certainty from Carey Price that he would ever play again was a bit shocking to me. Like I, I thought that there was a possibility that it lasting this long, that he was going to, you know, go into this press conference and basically say, I'm out, you know, you see pictures that he's posted on his Instagram over the year. And it's like just him really enjoying his time with his kids and, you know, talking about how, like, that's been the, the thing that's kept him going through this is he hasn't really had this before. And I'm like, maybe we're in a situation where, Carey Price realizes how much he has missed being with his family and that along with the injury issues that he's been dealing with and going through the player assistance program has changed what his motivation is going forward. What his priorities are in terms of his his life. And And, if that's the case, I I don't judge that 
one iota. <laughs> no, we both have kids. Like we, I get it, you know, and I, I non COVID years, I travel. I'm a gone a month of uh, a week of every month easily during, during the hockey season. So I'm away and I miss stuff and I make up, I try to make up for it in the summer, but I can't, I can't get that back. And I can't like the NFL is really, you know, like <laughs> it's tough on that. It, it's tough. Like a lot of like general managers or like scouts, they will tell you like, we're just so we miss so much of home life. And so I can't, I wouldn't fault him for that. And that's, that's he, it's, not only is he recognizing what he's missing, then he's going through, you know, what he was going through personally. And then the injury is a whole nother matter. So, yeah. and I think when somebody says that to you, says it openly, like we can think about it. I'm like, Oh, you know, that's a possibility. But then all of a sudden when they say it publicly, it's almost like, Oh, the thoughts you know, in like, their mind. Right. Right. It's all of a sudden, no, this is a distinct possibility because they wouldn't bring it up otherwise. Yeah. So, um, you know, as a person, I just hope that he has a happy life. And if he comes back, great, because I love watching him play. He's a fantastic goalie and I love his competitiveness. And I got the chance to see him watch, watch him play a lot through junior because I was based in the West for a long time and met his dad and a uh, super nice man. And, you know, I really root for him, but I get it if he doesn't come back. But it certainly changes the trajectory of this organization if he doesn't. Yeah, right? absolutely. Like with him and him and Weber are automatically gone, and that's off the cap. It's just like okay, it just sort of opens up the possibilities of what you do with your roster construction. Like it radically changes the strategies and the possibilities of what you could do in terms of okay, how do we build this team? Can can we look at it in a non traditional way? Instead of like, you know, the one through four lines and one through six D's or a different way to build a construct a team that would allow us to be more effective. And I'd like, I'm so that is the interesting thing. And I don't know, it's hard to predict that without, without knowing who else is going to be in this front office, because we really don't know a lot about Kent Hughes in terms of what he would do. Cause there's no track record. Like we yeah. know Jeff Gordon, which is great. And we know, and we have a, you know, I have a pretty good idea about Marty LaPointe. He's been on my show many times. We've had lots of discussions. So I have a, like a reasonable idea of what, you know, what he's thinking, but then there's a whole bunch of other voices that are going to come in and how does that influence the direction of what they do in terms of strategy? So it's very much still up in the air. Um, And I like the fact that they haven't gone out and made hires just to make hires. Mm-hmm. Like, I think that's one of the things that I like when you're like, you, when you're looking, you're speaking to an owner and about some of the things, and I wrote them down just out of like, you know, in this, for this discussion is just like value shifts in terms of, okay, what, what do we value? Not necessarily in terms of our values of what the organizational identity is. That's a whole nother like, discussion we can have, but not, you know, think about, you know, what do we value in terms of the p- type of players and, and what, we're looking for, you know, trapped by, don't be trapped by dogma, you know, owners sometimes have a, have a real difficulty suspending judgment and giving time to make proper decisions. So I think that's really like really important and, you know, to consider it from an ownership group and obviously from the management group. And I think you need seven people in your brain trust, like seven core people that you rely upon. Like, yes, you have to talk to everybody and everybody should have value and have input. But at the end of the day, it's, you know, you should have at least seven core people. Yeah, you always have and, a brain trust, right? Yes. Like, there's you know, always going to be in any organization a, a brain trust at the top. Yes. And, and and that's where you converge as a group. And I think when you're in a type in a group like that, um, every once in a while, there's always has to be somebody who is, you know, willing to not agree. Like, I, I think it's really important to have somebody in there who's willing to do that and go, let's think about this things differently. Um, you know, like, and you, you don't want to make changes for the necessary of making changes, like, because is, are the people that are there, are they part of the solution? You know, is, you know, in Montreal's case, you look at their drafting, developing, and, you know, the horrendous record, was that a process failure? Like, like, and then you have to go back and do, you know, a lot of different type of analysis on that. Like, you know, 
it's from a risk analysis on that, you know, I, I think, you know, you also have to look at some root cause analysis in, in those situations. So, and, did, and then once again, something we had brought up before about having cognitive diversity, like having some people from some different backgrounds, even though they're in hockey, different, right? Obviously, Kent Hughes coming in provides some cognitive diversity comparative to Jeff. And I think that's important. Now, can you expand upon that? I think that would be really interesting. And then what I found also interesting from not only Jeff Gordon's uh, press conference and then Kent Hughes's press conference, they were talking about, you know, along with obviously Jeff Molson was the identity. And I think in many cases, sometimes that can get confused. Okay, the identity of how you play is different than the organizational identity. And the Montreal Canadiens have, like, they're not a normal company. Like, you're not, you're not looking at, like, Time, what Time Warner or something where, like, yes, they're a company and they have an identity, but that's an organizational identity. Like, it's different from Montreal. They're a legacy organization identity. Like, their value and what they mean to the province of Quebec and the people in Montreal is so tangible. It actually, it's directly tied into how they view themselves. Like it's incredible how much impact this organization has and how much people identify this with this organization. So when I look at like, what is the identity of the organization, if I look at it from an outside perspective, the first thing that comes to my mind is Jean Beliveau. Yes, 100%. Like, yeah. Like if this organization's identity, from my perspective, is Jean Beliveau, is this is how we act. This is how we communicate. This is how we treat people. This is how we dress. This is like everything is through the lens of Jean Beliveau. Like, is if you, if every person in that, in that organization can conduct themselves in those, in, like Jean Beliveau would do, I think that really is a, a, like impactful. Is when in doubt, when things are stressful, you stop, breathe, and think, what would Jean Beliveau do in this situation? And if you can do that and then follow the, you know, follow, you know, his dignity, I think you go a long way in terms of having a successful franchise. How will you play on the ice? That's a different identity, but the identity of the, of the franchise, like I've been in the industry for 21 years. I've been in awe of two people when I met them. One was Jean Beliveau. The other one was Gordie Howe. When you meet them and shake their hand, you're in awe of yeah. that's like, I didn't grow up in Montreal fan like i'm gonna ha i have friends that are habs fan my wife happens to be a habs fan um but it's he's revered in the montreal canadians organization is revered it's like you know for my baseball buddies in 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 the states i'm like they're like the new york yankees whether you like them or not that's what that's where they are they are arguably the most revered franchise in the nhl yeah like, and i would say like them. if you can get a situation where you're Jean Beliveau for, for the organization, but Maurice Richard on the ice. That's kind of like the perfect Montreal mix, is it not? Yes, of course. You know, and that's to me. Not to about, besmirch Beliveau on the ice, but I just mean the fire of. Uh, absolutely. Maurice, right. And I think from like, to me, when I think of Jean Beliveau, it's just that the, the gentleman. Right. And every person in the organization, regardless of sex or orientation, can all be guided by those principles. This is what it means to be a Montreal Canadian. Whether you are a player or you work for the organization at whatever level, this is what it means to be a Montreal Canadian. Then you have that that's the flag that you plant. That's your why as an organization. And everybody can look to that in times of trouble or you're uncertain. You look to that. That's our why. This is what we value. This is our purpose. This is who we are. This is who we are to the world and follow it and never deviate regardless if things go bad. Doesn't matter. Never deviate from that because that if you look at successful organizations, they never deviate from their why. Oh, what's yeah. in, like, this is what their value systems is. And in many cases, it's interesting to have like when I read some Q and A's um, when we're talking about like the Logan Mayu situation is, you know, would things would have been different if that value system was entrenched of like, no, no, no. Like would Jean Beliveau have, would have drafted this guy. 
Yeah. And I'm not just I'm not just smirching the young man because everybody makes mistakes and he deserves a second chance and he has to earn it. And the Montreal Canadiens are going to do whatever they possibly can to help him get there. But it wouldn't be interesting in the process of your decision making is that that's part of your decision. That's the first thing you think of. Like, that's your why. And then you get to what you do and how you do it. But th- that's the first thing, right? Does that encompass the value systems of what Jean Beliveau is? Yeah. Does? And for those who are younger fans, just to illustrate who Jean Beliveau was, and this is like not an important thing in his life, obviously, but for me growing up, I grew up a Canadians fan. Uh, living in Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan. My great grandmother was a Canadians fan. My dad was an Oilers fan. I went with my great grandma because I remember watching Patrick Waugh on TV doing his little thing where he was talking to his posts and I was like glued. That was like the moment I remember specifically it was a game against the Hartford Whalers and I was like into it immediately. That's the guy that I'm obsessed with. That's who I want to be when I grow up. And, you know, obviously off ice stuff, notwithstanding with Patrick Waugh, but between the pipes, that's who I wanted to be. Uh, That's who got me onto the team. But I remember very vividly, I went to an old timers game with my dad back in the old crushed cannon Moose Jaw where the Warriors used to play. Great building, by the way. I love it. Yes. Stupid design, but it's so cool. (laughs) But uh, which is gone now, by the way, a couple years ago. Unfortunately. Very sad. I I remember when I saw that news, I was very upset. But uh, I went to an old timers game and a guy that my dad knew uh won a contest it was like in the programs your program could get called and if your number got called you got to like after the game go down and meet the the players and the old timers and he was like i'm an adult i don't need to meet the old timers here you have a kid and i i don't know if i was like five or six just a, a young kid who was just really into hockey at the time and jean beliveau was like the guy who was on that old timer squad he was the star attraction it was like him and eddie shack And at for some at some point, I got lost when we were heading towards the the locker room and I got separated from my dad. And there was an older lady there in a fur coat. I remember who was like, just stay here. Your dad will find you. Don't run around. So we missed the time slot that we were supposed to be in there for this to meet the old timers. And when we got there, the security guard was like really belligerent, like you missed your time. Get the hell out of here. Why are you here? Get this kid out of here. And like, you know, telling my dad, like, what, who do you think you are essentially? And Jean Beliveau heard this going on, came out of the locker room and was like, essentially, what are we doing here? This is what we're here for. Bring them in. And it was supposed to be like a five minute meet and greet kind of thing. And I was in there for much longer than that. Every single player in there signed my program. You know, it was just like you're a kid. You don't know how big it is, but you realize how big it is. And to me, Jean Beliveau will always be like this mountain of a man because of that moment, even though I was born way after he retired. You know, like I've barely seen a handful of his games in his career. Right. So it's. That's the kind of person that Shane is talking about the Canadians modeling their organizational attitude after. And I think that's important to understand that he is the person that most represents what the Montreal Canadians should be. Uh, Before we move on to other things, I did want to backtrack a little bit to what you were saying before, which was that we know a bit about Sean Gorton and, or Jeff Gorton, sorry. And, we're talking about, you know, things that are going to change in the next little while for the Montreal Canadiens. And obviously Jeff Petrie was in the news today because Kent Hughes talked about Jeff Petrie. We are going to talk about that as well, but Carey Price was the topic du jour because of the press conference that he did. We know that Jeff Gorton from experience is not hesitant to move on from franchise goaltenders after what happened when he was in charge of the New York Rangers, right? buying out Henrik Lundqvist. Now, it turned out that Lundqvist had to retire and they didn't actually need to do that. <laughs> like He never played another game for another franchise, which frankly, as much as I wanted him to continue his career because I loved Henrik Lundqvist, it's kind of nice that he only played for the Rangers. Like that's, that's yes. a nice, a nice yeah, career. He, he's a he's a ranger. He is a ranger. And he's a ranger. He had his number retired, I believe, on Saturday. Was It, it was a fantastic ceremony. As yes. Well. I mean, 
I always put Montreal Canadiens at the pinnacle of ceremonies. They always do it perfectly. But the Rangers did as just as good a job as the Habs do. Like, I was fortunate to go to uh, the Montreal Forum. Like, we went on this crazy road trip and drove from BC all the way to the East Coast to see the Boston Garden, um, the Montreal Forum, Maple Leaf Gardens, Chicago Stadium, because we knew they were being torn down. And there was nothing more, like, and one of my, my, one of my best friends is a Habs fan. And being in that building, it's like reverence. I'm not a Habs fan, but it's reverence. It's history. It's like palatable. And to watch all the people in the lower bowl in their suits and ties and the women in their dresses and they're all dressed up. Like, I miss that. Like, that's what separates Montreal from all these other franchises. Who does that? Like, what other franchise dresses up to go to a game anymore? It's usually we slap out and I'm wearing a hoodie and, you know, a pair of jeans. I'm like, that is what makes, like, there's nothing like a Saturday night game in Montreal, in any yeah. city. And I've been to them, almost all of them, right? So I, I wonder like if that. the Canadians could do something like, because I feel like that kind of thing for the modern time is probably too stuffy to do, like, every game or something like that. But I, I wonder if they could institute a thing where it's like, one or two home games a year it's like Every, everybody but, dresses up yeah it's the forum game and everybody yes. go and you're wearing your suit or your dress and you know if you want to be real fancy you could bring your fedora you know a uh, guest from the last show avery would love it uh, yeah it would i be... have a whole bunch of them in like actually in my office that i wear yeah, so oh, like nice. uh, that would be really fun. Bring some personality back, you know. Obviously, once fans are allowed back in the building, because no one's dressing up. Yeah, right I now. mean that's a that's yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I think that would be fun. Yeah, so basically, what my point was before that was uh, with the whole Carey Price situation. If Carey Price is, and I, I know he mentioned that if he is going to come back, he wants to play here. That his family is settled here. This is his home. And I believe him when he says that. I don't think he has any reason to lie. Like if he wanted to be out, he would probably he could be out. Yeah, he could probably tell the organization, and it would be a different conversation today. But if he wants to step away from the game, I am sure that Jeff Gordon would find a way to make that happen because he's already done it before in a move that I would assume was, you know, I know it was seen as necessary in New York at the time, but was also probably not the most popular move just because of what he's, what Lundqvist meant to that organization and prices meant a similar amount to the Montreal Canadians. But uh, yeah, we got to talk about Jeff Petrie because Kent Hughes mentioned that uh, like, it's kind of been misconstrued. I haven't been able to sit down and read the entire article because I have two kids at home that are small and on the weekend, I don't so get, do I. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I don't get time to myself, so I can't sit down and read an article and then also like translate it on the fly because it was written in French. But I've seen a lot of people saying like Kent Hughes is actively trying to shop Jeff Petrie. My uh, understanding is that Kent Hughes and Petrie have talked and that the situation is that maybe Petrie isn't very happy. And we know that his family has been in Detroit all year long, so he doesn't have his family with him uh, between injury and illness and the Habs being terrible. I feel like, you know, it makes sense that he's not happy. He expected after sure. last season yeah. to be a competitive team again. He's been, I know from speaking with people close to Petrie, that he has been very gung-ho to stay in Montreal since he came here. And that's why he signed that contract here, because frankly, at the time that he signed it, a uh, six point two five or six point seven five, I forget which is what he's making right now. It isn't an expensive deal for what he was providing at that time. So things have changed rather rapidly for the Petrie family. And essentially what Kent Hughes was saying was if Petrie needs a change of scenery, that he is willing to accommodate that now on the on one side, that doesn't really necessarily mean anything because we're speculating on possibly Petrie wanting out or wanting to be reunited with his family during the season. But also, th this is a level of transparency that we haven't seen in the Montreal Canadiens organization in a very long time. Yes, and one of the things that, like, you know, you look at from Kent Hughes' perspective is that because he's, like, both him and Jeff Gordon are new, they don't 
they don't have any loyalty in terms of this is these are my guys, but they have they're professional and they have empathy for these players. And there's nothing wrong with having the conversation of like, how do you feel at this time? What do you think? Like, these are the yeah. things that we may have to do in this franchise. Like, is this something you want to be a part of? Like, we understand, we appreciate your loyalty. And if you want to stay, great. If you want to move on, we'll do whatever we can to accommodate you because you've been great to this franchise and you treat the players properly. Because yes. if you don't think the players don't talk, the players talk, right? How you treat your players even if you're moving them is absolutely critical about you, not only, not only acquiring players, but you know, like in trades, but also in free agency. And hey, look, people, players that I've talked to love playing in Montreal. They love playing there because the fans are bananas. Like they love, like everything is about the haps, right. And being in an organization in a city where everything's about what you do, it's great. I couldn't, I don't know. I'm a competitor. I don't know what it'd be like to play in a team like Arizona or like maybe Florida where it's not top of mind. I'd rather be in like the fire, like right into it. Yeah. I just like, if you're going to win, you want to win in a place where the city would go bananas. I forget. There was a player recently. I, I forget who it was now. It was, it was during this season. I think it was someone talking about Montreal might have been a retired player, but it was like if you're somebody who isn't a professional is a professional athlete and you don't want to play in the market that like loves it the most or that is like the most intense and the most like uh, into it when you're winning. What are you even doing this for? And yeah. unfortunately, there are a lot of guys in the league who just they don't want to be. It's a level of um, scrutiny that you have to mentally, emotionally, you better be ready for it, right? Because it's just, there's such a high level of expectation. It's not even necessarily even expectation from the fan base because look, fans are fanatic. It's their, like the Montreal Canadiens, that's their tribe. This is their clan, right? Like the logo is their, like that's their banner and they feel like they need to go to war. Like it's mentally, human beings are really not, that terribly sophisticated no so like as you see behind me like you know i have like an Oilers jersey and a red wings jersey because those were the teams of mine growing up and my grandfather bought me my first Oilers jersey at my first game I ever went to at northlands coliseum beating the jets seven to two um you know so i get it i understand it so for me like i don't like i don't understand players that wouldn't want to why, why wouldn't you want to play in montreal or new york or Chicago or Philly or Boston or Toronto, like Vancouver fans are nutty. Like the two Alberta teams are nuts. Winnipeg's crazy, right? Like there's some teams out there that like they're, they're all in. So I think there's an allure to be in Montreal, the history, like the history alone is worth it. Yeah. And I don't know, like, and I think, I think the you know, and the media is I think pretty fair. In Montreal, I don't think they're too extreme. Like go, it, go, go see the media in the Premier League. You <laughs> yeah, know, oh like, yeah, that's the whole different ball game, right? Like they're they're that's a whole nother level. I mean, there are moments where you know I think the media can kind of push it, push the limits. And I'm a you know as a member of, you know member of the like the the writer writing media for a long time. I get it, but boy, it could be so much more harsh. Oh yeah, and, I think there are certain players who get keyed on. Uh, I think Jonathan Duran gets a lot more negative press than he deserves. Uh, I think there's a specific thing in Montreal where, especially if a Francophone player is sold as like an elite player or a franchise level player and they right. fail to live up to those expectations, they just get. And, and then whose fault is vilified. that? Is yes, that, that's, that's the organization's, the organization's fault. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And that's where like the transparency and the messaging has to be, especially for a young player. It's like, you got to tone everything down. Yeah. And it doesn't matter that you're a top five pick. That's like, you know, you need time, right? Like we were, I was talking about, uh, talking to somebody yesterday about, we're talking about how successful Detroit was in the pre salary cap era. And I said, well, they had a $91 million salary cap. Like they, they just spent $91 million. 
and they were talking about, well, you know, they bought, they bought all these players. I said, that's not what they, I don't, I, I disagree. And I said, that's not what they bought. What they bought was time. Mm-hmm. Time is the most valuable asset to a general manager or a president of hockey operations is time. So what they brought was time to allow their prospects to percolate. We talk about that, the Detroit model of letting their prospects percolate. Well, they're allowed to do that because they kept buying the Robitaille's and the Hulls and the Chelios's of the world. They just kept like getting guys like that and adding to their franchise because they, their Mike Illich would allow them to do that. Not all franchises would do that. So what it bought them was the most valuable asset you can have as a general manager is time. So for both for, you know, for Jeff Gordon and for Kent Hughes, it's about finding ways to buy time, not just in the development standpoint, but like, so you can make decisions from that standpoint. So streamlining your processes and having smart people around you who can like provide you Intel quicker and that do better research at a, in a highly effective way. And, you know, that's why I actually, I give credit. I read an article on the athletic. I want to like point it out. So uh, Mark Antoine uh, got in, wrote a really interesting article about if anybody gets to read it on the athletic about how to build an analytics department. Now the analytics department name, I think is antiquated, but I thought like his process of how he broke it down was very, very good. And I think he made a really strong point about, you know, if you're bringing these people, make sure they have a master's degree or higher, of like a high level of in their discipline, but then you're going to have to pay for them. Like industries outside of hockey, they don't, they don't pay their analysts $60,000 and hire some kid just out of school, you're going to have to pay at minimum $150,000, closer to $200,000 for top level people, or you're never going to get them out of their jobs. Even if they love hockey and they have like a passion for hockey and they do it on the side or they do it like, you know, they write papers about it in their academic field. Like you can't get, you can't cut your salary in half just to go work for an NHL team. So teams like you're willing to invest all this money in the players, but then you're not willing to invest say a million dollars or $1.5 million. Like that's a fourth line player. Yeah. And that's, that's a that's, fourth, that's a fourth line player. That's what we said last time. Right. Was like, it's crazy. invest a fourth line player in saving you $20 million. <laughs> right. <laughs> I have to do a quick it, shout out to uh, Sandis in the chat here, staying up in Latvia. To watch and, this show. Awesome. I love the Latvian fans. If you were going to go to an international tournament. Oh, yes. Latvian Latvian fans, playing, oh their fans are, their fans are awesome. I uh, afterwards, after an international tournament, the World Juniors, myself and Russ Cohen, my old co-host, we went out with the Latvians and had a few adult beverages and they're <laughs> super fun. So always I always love having the shout out to the Latvians. Yeah, I remember for a very long time on like Steve Dangle's uh, reaction like his main YouTube page, his most viewed video was like a Canada versus Latvia reaction video, or it might've just been like him going off about Christopher's Gudlevskis after that game when Canada, I think won like one, nothing or no, it was two, one. So I think Latvia stood scored because yeah, yeah. most of the game Latvia scored, like they scored on a breakaway and then they just like shelled the whole game and Canada was freaking out because they just barely snuck it by, snuck it by and won that game. And it was his most viewed video because, like, everyone in Latvia was watching this video of the Canadian freaking out about Latvia. And I just find that so compelling because those smaller hockey countries, I I don't think we talk enough about how hockey mad they can be when they just have, like, a modicum of success, which is why, like, part of me is very excited about where this sport can go in the future because it's like we've only tapped... A handful of countries yes in terms of yeah. like getting the best out of them for like best players i feel like we've just got so much more to go like you look at some of the german players coming out now like leon dreisaitl switzerland all of a sudden has like several stars in the league germany is starting to pump out some players actually the czech republic is starting to make a big surge yeah back. they're coming back yeah slovakia in this year's draft is gonna have a lot of top end players in the first couple rounds so that's really that's great as well it's actually funny because you talk about the european contingent if you look at like the habs drafting in europe you know from like 06 to 15 they drafted 14 players out of europe only two turned out um so that's something i think investing a lot like this one of the things i i keep i talk to people that i know that or in NHL teams, I'm like, how come you don't have more European scouts? 
Like, how do you have like four or five scouts to cover that continent, including yeah. Russia, which is massive? I'm like, like one minute. one scout it's for crazy. Russia, <laughs> and you're going from like Moscow to like Ufa, <laughs> like that. It's it's crazy, right? So like, I'm like, well, why can't you have like eight scouts in Europe? I mean, and this is like emerging markets, like take advantage of the Latvias and the, and the, you know, those type of marketplaces, you know, more, more eyes on Switzerland and Germany. And like, so that you can you know, try to like mine some players in the later rounds that could potentially turn into, turn into players. Like an example, I'll give credit to Brad Allen on my show, my co-host, he was, at, um, had talked about Latvian players way ahead in the draft before, you know, other people like months ahead and then the Vancouver Canucks go and draft a you know a, like a player who may turn out to be pretty good in an obscure market so you know I look it's interesting with the Habs and I can understand why the fans are upset if you look at their you know scouting development success rates and or failures you know it's the first round picks that killed them but their yeah. second and third round rounds were fine they're fine but that first round they had 10 draft picks from 06 to 15, four players played more than 200 games in the NHL. Six didn't. Their success rate is 40% in the first round. That's crazy. You can't Not get great. away with that. Like, <laughs> even if you got, say you got, say you got nine out of 10. Now, how much better would the Habs been? They would have been probably around 18th. So instead of being last, 30th, they would have been to 18th. Would have significantly changed. Would have fit David Fisher would have played or Lou LeBlanc. Or Tenorti would have got to over 200 games, or Mike McCarron, or Nikita Skurback, or Nola Juleson. I mean, that changes your whole franchise. Yeah, it does. Hey, there's, there, there's three defensemen there that could be like your three, four, and five. Yeah. Uh, a comment here saying hockey is also like not especially accessible, even in Canada. Canada's best women's hockey player quit when she was 12. Yeah, I mean, for men as well, but like for women especially, like not even yes. having a league to play in often. Like that, and, that's a whole other discussion that I definitely want to get into. I don't think we have time for it tonight. Cause I no, feel like you can just rhapsodize about that for an hour about how hockey's biggest today. issue is money. I, I had a, a big meeting about that today for an hour with somebody who's really trying to change the, how inclusive it is, but how like the money is available to have these kids play. It's out there. We have enough corporate support and we have enough support from ph philanthropy to make that happen but we don't make it as a culture as inclusive as it needs to be. And that's really about changing the whole mindset of like, first thing we need to do is the people who feel excluded, we have to humanize mm. how, how they feel like to the people that are already in the culture. Because the one thing I really love about hockey culture is when bad things happen, boy, do we rally. Look what happened in Humboldt as an example, or when somebody has cancer, we always rally but we tend not to rally around these situations because we haven't humanized it within our culture. And the minute we do that, it becomes more normalized. And then when it does, that's when we start to, like we can start to educate. And then there's, that's where ch change happens. Like I look at it from like, I grew up with my mom who happened to be disabled. So for me, being around somebody who was disabled, it's normalized for me. So I don't even think about it. Like, it's just like, Okay. Or when like the women, uh, both the women were hired in Vancouver with, you know, and, and, you know, as a mutual friend of ours, Rachel was hired and everybody's like jumping up and down and so excited. And my reaction to my wife was, yeah, cause they should be hired because yep. they're, they're going to do a great job because I grew up around fem women that were highly intelligent and highly capable and were like formidable. So to me, it's normal. So like, that's where we have to sort of get our culture to the point where like, I don't like you were a goalie. Like if you wanted to wear a tutu and a clown like wig, but you were the best goalie, I don't care that you want to do that. Get in the net and stop some blocks. <laughs> right. Cause we got to win a game. Right. It's like, it doesn't matter. Right. Like in the grand scheme of things, right. Like we have to take some of the, the good things that about being Canadian. Cause obviously this is like more Canadian based show, but in the United States too, about what's so great about like, our culture in hockey and we just have to take those things and go and be able to bridge that gap said, Hey, we do all this stuff in these areas and we can do it in these areas too. It's easy. We just have to humanize it and normalize it for you. 
so that you can we can you relate that to that you know the the, the maybe they, they go to a hospital and one of the maybe one of the kids is disabled well that's normal like that's the players are all over that they do that like on purpose because they love it well it's no different than someone else who happens to be of a different part of our community or like a minority who just feels excluded like they're ex- it's the same thought process and once you normalize it for people and humanize it boy it changes everything so i'm crossing my fingers like there's things about our hockey culture that i don't like but there's some really great things too and i don't want to dog pile and say everything about hockey culture is awful because that's what's actually been happening lately and there's a part of me that wants to like fight about it like i actually i get my back up because that's not fair like it's not all terrible and awful yes horrible things happen and they shouldn't happen but look at all the great things that come out of hockey and the hockey culture as well as well and i'm not justifying the bad things but we you know we need to have to put some perspective of in those respects because it gets a little bit out of hand yeah i think that uh, some of the things that have happened are definitely awful heavy to like it's hard to weight it you know what i mean because you know you look at kyle beach and we won't get into that too heavily like something like that happens i don't really think too much about like rallying around humboldt you know what i mean like it, it just like that weighs heavier for me but uh, let's let's move on from hockey culture a bit just because i feel like we're gonna get into again a very long discussion <laughs> But I had a, I, like I take notes during the game and we'll wrap it up a little bit here uh, talking about the game again. And the one note that I had that like I circled was that the guys who care all the time care. Turi Lekkonen. Yes. Arturi Lekkonen, yeah. Brendan Gallagher, Tyler Toffoli. I think you'd say Nick Suzuki. But the guys who show up, who, who always show up, showed up in this one and I, I look and we I think we talked about it the last time too, where we talked about Toffoli and Lekin and I feel like Gallagher yes. is less a guy that might stick around just because he's got term and I don't think he wants to stick around for a rebuild. But he had a quote after the game, which is very enlightening. The minute you uh, the minute losing feels normal or you're numb to it, you're playing the wrong sport. And that's like very much Brendan Gallagher in a nutshell. Sure. But you could see the fire in him tonight and, you know, coming back after a couple weeks off and, you know, he got injured, I think in his first or second game back after being gone for a while as well, hasn't played a lot of hockey lately, immediately uh, best uh, differentials on the team tonight, despite the fact that he was playing with Mike Hoffman, who when Hoffman was away from him was (laughs) getting absolutely sewered. So he was carrying the bag with Hoffman, uh, the whole thing, like with Lekkonen, I am more convinced every game that they shouldn't trade him. But I, I'm looking at his stat line now, and he's now on pace over an 82 game season for 40 points, which would be a career high for him. He's only, re- he's that's only, shooting, it, though. yeah, I know it's it's only he's only shooting at his career average, and he's still on pace for like a very very good season. And I'm like, I don't know, man. They're gonna get good offers. But I, it's like, I thinking to myself, what team that could offer like just a first, would you actually be willing to accept? And it's like, if it's Colorado, who I think he would fit amazingly with, I don't think a first round pick gets it done because it's basically a second round pick. Well, mm, first round pick would be extremely difficult to not take. I, like if you're going to say, oh, we're going to give you a B-level prospect and a second round pick, I'm like, beat it. Because those type of players are, ne- are necessary on each line. These are like the, you know, they're the energy line drive in that respect. And as much as I wouldn't really want to trade Brennan Gallagher, because he's really the, you know, the straw that stirs the drink. We talk about that con- contagious type of attitude. Well, that's what Gallagher brings, and you need that around those young guys. So there is a really bal- really big balancing act between when if he leaves the room, that void, and who's replacing that. Uh, that's really critical because 
I always look back at the Edmonton Oilers when they had all those young guys and they gave them all $6 million a year and the accountability wasn't there because they were so young that I think it's like, that's a tough, like I watched Gallagher play all his time in junior with the Vancouver Giants. So when he was drafted, I said to Louis Jean, I'm like, Louis, this kid's going to play. Like, not only he's going to play, he's probably going to have a letter. And he said, you're crazy. Like, he just like, he's a fifth round pick. I'm like, Louis, trust me. I've seen this kid play. He's like, even if he plays on the third line, he's going to be hell on wheels. And he's turned into far more than even I predicted. So I wouldn't trade. I don't know if I'd want to trade Lekin. I think you can make a really great case for not trading him unless you get an offer that you can't refuse. I think there's a case even to keep Gallagher, although he may not want to stick around for a rebuild, retool. Um, and it and really depends on what happens with price too. It's yeah. a huge factor. Like if Kerry says I'm done, then, you know, Petrie and Gallagher and those guys are going to say, well, me too. It was, it was a great <laughs> run, but you know, I think the franchise would be better if we like moved on and they could just do what they think is best to, you know, rebuild this franchise in a, in a fast way. Cause there's still lots of really good pieces on this team. And there's like prospects that we had talked about in the last um last time i was on like it's just about really making sure that you put the development into it so i don't like i don't know from an asset management standpoint i would have to really dig deep into which guys like can go or are worthwhile like trading off depending on the assets you get in return but there's some guys that just that are in your room that you just can't afford to get rid of yeah and i I feel like that's the thing like if and I don't think it would happen during this season if they do move on from Gallagher. I feel like that would be probably an off-season move. I think there's a a really good chance that with Dustin Brown's contract uh, being over in L.A. that uh, he reunites with Phil Deneau and Mark Bergevin. You know, he has a great relationship with Mark Bergevin. I feel yeah. like Gallagher would jump at the place, at the chance to play with Deneau again. I think that's a great fit for him with also the style that they play and, you know, being on the verge of being a contender again as their young players come up. But that's a good trading partner based on how many good prospects the LA. Exactly. Have. Right. They and, have yeah. the ability to move guys and not necessarily hurt too much from it, which is always a good position. Oh, no, they have a, they're deep. I mean, and that's like you give credit to Mark and and his staff and the amateur staff. And because they've done an exceptional job of like, he rebuilt, he built it with Mike food at once. And then, you know, they went into a re kind of a rebuild and he rebuilt them again. So yeah, if you're not good, like I could go through a few teams where, Oh, those are the teams you want to go after. Like yeah. you want to, you want to be knocking on Anaheim's door. You want to be knocking on LA's door for sure. You want to like, even the New York Rangers, they got some players there like, okay, how far can we go in the next two years? And they got some young players that they may be willing to sacrifice for like, okay, let's push our chips in a little bit farther to the middle of this table. So like, I wouldn't totally dismiss craft stuff. I wouldn't dismiss like, there's some players in there. Like, what are they going to do with Zach Jones and like Niels Lundquist? Like, so, you know, when you're looking around the league and you're Kent Hughes and, and Jeff Gordon, of course, Jeff would know that franchise exceptionally well in New York, but you know, there are some, there's some options out there for Montreal. So I think the retool could happen faster depending on the prospects. If they do get prospects in return for trades, what age are they? Where are they in their development? You know, if they are the 21, 20, you know, they're farther along than the 18 year old or like the draft pick. I'd rather take a, a prospect who is in like kind of like the 19, 20, 21 years of age, 22, than a second round pick. Yeah. Because I feel that, like you, that, you're looking for another that's Nick five Suzuki. years down the road. Yeah. You're, yeah. You're looking like that's what you're essentially trying to do is what Bergevin did. I will say like trades were actually he, he made some really good trades. Yeah. And that one what, specifically was probably the, the last great thing that he did. I mean, I guess you could also put in the signing Tyler to Foley was a great one too, but I think oh. like looking forward to what they're going to do in the next little while here and how deep the teardown is going to go. I think the three players that I look at as, providing the possibility of continuity and leadership into their rebuild are Gallagher to Foley and Lekkonen. And I feel like you cannot move all three of those and have a rebuild. That's going to last less than five years. No, it'll be 
No. Like the problem when you get rid of those guys, and it also depends on what you get in return, but if it's mostly draft picks, the problem is those draft picks are so far away from contributing. We're talking five to seven years in some cases. So when you're making those type of trades, it's more about, okay, like maybe it's a player that is a lower end player. They have to move because of contract and you're willing to eat that. But then we want a prospect and a pick prospect and a pick every trade you make, you want a prospect and a pick like, because you want the extra value obviously of the draft picks so that you have, you have waves in sequence years so that, you know, in this two, three year period, we have these, these guys in this age group, and we have so many guys in this age group, and then we have so many guys in this age group, so that you have that constant wave, so that there isn't dips, because you can see in other franchises, all of a sudden, the box, the bottom falls out of the cardboard box, because they don't have anybody within a three year age group of say, 21, 22, 23, and all their guys are too young, and the other guys are too old, and now they're like sort of stuck in that mushy middle where it's really important to sort of when you make those trades is sort of see, try to sequence that in terms of the age, if you can, in that respect, like, so, you know, get a couple of guys that are 21 and a couple of guys that are 20, a couple are 19, right. And push them along. So it'll be fascinating. I think there are a few teams out there that are in this sort of mode that Montreal's in and see who does the best asset management yeah. from that respect. Like that's going to be interesting. And the drafts in Montreal this year, right? So if you can load up on some extra picks, that never hurts in terms of, you know, providing some hope for the for the for the fans and give them something to cheer about. Because it's probably my favorite place to go to the draft. Montreal, Nashville, um, are great. I wish they'd have a draft in Vegas because that would be fun too. But. I think that's fun. the plan soon, isn't it? I feel like that's somewhere in the plans to have the draft in Vegas. I'm sure that all the NHL execs would love that. I feel like Vegas, I, I've been to Vegas twice, and I will say that uh, the first time I stayed five days, and that was too long. I feel like three days is the most you should be able to stay well, in Vegas that and enjoy depends. yourself. That depends who you're with and what you're doing. <laughs> so three days can be like a long run, and five days can be fine depending on what you're doing. You may have to like spread yourself out, but that was something I was thinking about is like you could have the draft in Montreal every third year and like pretty much every second year you have it in Vegas or almost in every, almost every year, because you could do the board of governors meeting, the GM's meetings, you could do like the uh, award show and the draft for two days. And around that you do all these different types of like events, card, like card conventions and like, you know, signings and have like these, they have these really cool theaters where the old timers can get up and tell stories like it would be fun a whole week of like hockey fun in Vegas because they have all like it's easy to get to the flights are cheap hotel is not expensive and then you just have everybody on the strip yeah every uh, second year was we had in a Vegas. question here saying why does it matter where the draft is it only benefits the media I will say Thomas uh, that's not actually true uh, if you ever get a chance of all the NHL events that there are the draft is by far the most fun uh, if you're yeah, a fan, it's not even close. if you're yeah. like it definitely for media as well, like it is the biggest party for media, but the draft is unbelievably fun. You know, like I've been to the NHL awards, not fun, really boring, but it's just like experiencing a city with a bunch of people, with a bunch of hockey fans. It is From an everywhere. absolute madhouse. Yes, it is like a confluence of all these different people from all over the pl place that love the same thing. The all-star game is like, yeah, it's most like right now it's kind of for kids. I have thoughts on how to fix that, but that's, I'll save that for another show. Uh, we'll, we'll probably wrap it up here. I really thank everyone for joining us tonight. We had actually like really decent numbers the whole show because clearly people wanted to talk about this game, but, uh, really thanks to Shane for jumping on with me again. I feel like our discussions are always super enlightening. Everybody watching, learn some stuff. So, uh, before we uh, close things out, Shane, tell everybody where to find your work, and uh, then we'll see you in a while, because it's not going to be another Habs game until February 8th. This is the last in a bit, but I will say middle. there's going to be an announcement tomorrow on the Steve Dangle podcast, so stay tuned to that. I don't know if that's been teased at all on the Discord yet, but there will be an announcement tomorrow on the Steve Dangle podcast. So, uh, Shane, where can everybody find your work? 
Uh, you can always find uh, me on Twitter at Shane Malloy, as well as the radio show is HP Radio. So it's Hockey Prospect Radio, and you hear it every Saturday and Sunday on NHL Network Radio, which is channel 91. Saturday, it plays about five times, but it's guaranteed to be on Saturday morning from 7 to 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, and then Sunday at 8 to 10 a.m., but it ends up being played five times. So we have great guests, so we're, uh, we're going to have a fantastic show up- upcoming this week as well. Awesome. Can't wait. And yes, yes, everyone, an announcement. <laughs> Seriously. All right, we'll uh, close this out. I, again, thank you everyone for watching in this stupid season that is not at all what we planned. Uh, <laughs> I can't wait for a bit of a break from the Habs, to be honest with you, but I will miss everyone who tunes in. We'll see you on February.